Hi, everybody. My name is Sharon Matthews, and here's my colleague, Amanda House. We both are data scientists from McAfee. We are here to present our session on ethical AI. With that being said, we are here throughout the session, so feel free to put out your questions in the chat. Now, going over ethical AI. Bias in AI has become a hot topic. Most research focuses on bias applied to humans. Now, should I be wary of AI? Right? Of key concern is whether a model could potentially harm an underprivileged group. Suppose a university decides to take historical admissions data and build a model to automate decision making processes for incoming freshmen. How do you think we could improve that decision making and check if there are any human errors or bias introduced in it? Now, if you look closer at the data set over the last 10 years, the university has admitted more than twice more than men than women. Now, this data set has bias from previous humans making decisions. What happens when we train a model on that bias? The model will essentially learn that bias, and this will be present in its classification. So the algorithm will learn to accept more men applications over women. Now, this problem is wide reaching. A NIST report recently did a deep dive on facial recognition models and found that many exhibit bias towards the races of countries that they were trained on. Facial recognition systems or facial recognition technologies have been used by police forces for more than two decades. Recent studies by MIT and NIST have found that while the technology works relatively well on Caucasian men, the results are less accurate in other demographics, in part which, where, where it lacks diversity. There is another work by Coded Bias, which is premiered on Sundance Film Festival and also which is available now on Netflix. It follows the MIT's work our researchers work in her exploration of bias in facial recognition technologies. Now, she started investigating this bias in AI after noticing that a facial recognition program cannot identify her face. As a woman of color, the technology only registers the face when she puts a white mask. And after further investigation, she detected a pattern. An FRT or a facial recognition technology and an AI technology tends to be biased against historically marginalized people. Now let's move on to ingrained algorithmic bias. What does it mean? Now Duke University researchers have created an algorithm, an AI algorithm called Pulse, that pixelates a picture of a face and then explores a range of possibilities, which means which is computer generated images that can produce pixelated face. Now the input can be a low resolution input image. The output is a style GAN generated high resolution image which is perceptually realistically and down, downscale image. Now, one troupe of Hollywood spy movies has taken a turn towards this. I feel you can create a very high quality image from a bl blurry or a grainy pixelated image. Now, AI has delivered part of this uh, fr from that. As you can notice, AI generated photorealistic image from low resolution image actually looks very similar to the person that is being given. So for example, the image on the left of the Mona Lisa, there is actually no resemblance from the image on the right that you see. Like the image that is being created from the road resolution image only contains so much information. However, convincingly, the AI renders that imaginary face and the computer generated face can be quite uncanny these days. But there is no dodging the fact that the original Im image was actually very information sparse. Move on to the next slide. <clears throat> So this is an example of how AI turned Barack Obama into a white man. The input is actually a low resolution image of Barack Obama, which was incorporated into an algorithm designed to generate pixelated faces. The result was being a white man and the, new, and the newly published and reproduced image clearly il illustrates the bias in AI research. Bias is not just about Obama or you know, in any actress or anything, some, someone specific like that. The point is, what causes these outputs and how does AI bias occur? For that, first we need to know a bit more about the technology that is being used here. The software that generates these images makes use of the technology that I mentioned previously, which is called Pulse, which mainly uses a technique that is like upgrading the level of visual data processing. Upgrading is like zooming or optimizing that we see on TV, but unlike Hollywood movies, new programs cannot de create data from nothing. These programs employ ML models to fill in those blanks and convert a low resolution image to a high resolution image. Now to do this, 
the technology made use of another algorithm, which is called StyleGAN, which is mainly responsible for creating very realistic looking faces for the people who are not even present. If you wish to like, if you wish to see more examples of StyleGAN created images, please feel free to refer this website, this person does not exist, which creates very realistic looking faces that are often used to create fake social media profiles. This is part of the technology which is used for creating deep fakes. Now this technology creator said that when using this algorithm to extend the range of pixels, the algorithm actually generated faces with Caucasian features. It created le less faces with people of color. So this bias is actually inherited from the style gain bias set of data, which means there might be other factors that, that they don't realize, but the training data it had a bias, inbuilt bias in it. So in other words, given the nature of the data, that StyleGAN has been trained on, whenever it tries to create a face that looks like a dotted input image, it automatically orient orients into white shapes, which means that whenever you are de deploying any kind of technology like this, it has to be well-tested. Now, moving on to the part as to why AI must be ethical and why we as you know, security professionals must be considered toward it. So first part I think is on facial recognition. Now, facial recognition has improved over time. It's, I think probably, often a reliable tool and it does make mistakes. Now, like humans, it can make mistakes in interpreting the results pro produced by the facial recognition tool. AI, if, if, you, if you train the model poorly, AI can develop strong bias. Now, this can go for many other variables, you know, beyond gender, ethnicity, or economic wealth. It can go to any other variable imaginable. So since AI is mainly trained on historical data, it will learn the decisions based on those ideas. Additionally, there's something called over-reliance. What it means is that AI can make mistakes and that too critical mistakes. So one must note that a well-trained AI will often be better in predicting that a human, but it can make mistakes. AI is an incredible technology which might provide fantastic benefits, but it must be regulated. Additionally, I feel AI must have an explainable log and it must be governed. Now, if you cannot explain your model, you cannot trust it. AI as such must be transparent and humans must be able to know as to why AI has made that particular decision. Now, humans cannot completely over rely on AI. Our future will undoubtedly consist of human machine collaboration, but that doesn't mean that people should over rely on machines, especially when AI is dealing with human making decisions. This is coming from a more generic part. Now, now you might be saying why as I as a security professional should care about it. I don't train models to determine whether you know, someone gets a loan or someone goes to a college. The only data maybe I look at is malware classification for file-based detection. Now, while that might be true, bias is important for every profession, whether you're dealing with humans or not. So as security professional as such, we approach the model building with our own biases. There are a number of static dynamic features that we collect say from file. It is also possible that we might be bringing our own personal bias that we introduce to the model. So for example, let's talk about the source data. The data can create bias when the source models are, or source materials rather, aren't very diverse. What it means is that the AI that is fed to the bias data is going to understand only a partial view of the world and make decisions based on that narrow understanding. To give an example, say you have a spam classifier and it was trained on some representative set of benign classifiers. It wasn't rather trained on a representative set of benign emails. Suppose you have emails of different languages or something that makes use of slang. So in inevitably will provide falses when you actually see that in the real test data. Even commonly used, uh, you know, misintentional use of grammar, spellings, and even syntax might actually cause your spam classifier to block some benign text. So that being said, this is something that can be introduced. Additionally, you, not all your files are equal. So for human data, you have privileged class, you have unprivileged class. Now, if you build a model that supports or favors rather your privileged class unfairly, we further hurt the unprivileged minority. Now, for example, let me give a very, very similar example in security domain. Uh, say you have PE files, which are the most commonly used malwares. So if there are more PE files in your data set than other samples, potentially, we might be able to create a model which favors PEV samples more. Now, does that mean that your detected malicious samples of other class like VB, does that make it harder? Or does that make, open your model to more vulnerabilities? Now, while our data might not directly have 
human related features our models do impact humans now now next move on to how do we connect explainability on to bias and how explainability as a concept can be used to improve or you know explain explain better now what this slide is taken from a paper the the work is taken from a paper but what this work essentially tries to do is it tries to draw connections between model insights and explanations so what we are trying to do here is we are trying to understand xai and bias from a very cognitive perspective it draws connections between model insights explanations that the ai algorithm commonly produce and in turn proposes of a term which is called a user centric xai framework the image that you see on the right now within this framework using framework like this an xai researcher or even a designer can actually identify pathways along which uh, say human cognitive patterns can be can drive for building xai models and how xai can be used to mitigate any kind of bias so for doing this there are four key aspects the four key aspects that you see on the left most bottom the left uh, left figure on on the bottom one is how do people usually reason or how do they make it? how do how should people reason and how do people do it right now and then we'll talk about take an example from each as to how explanations are currently being generated and then how xai can support that reasoning to make it better so first point how do people uh, how how should people rather reason or explain so if if i can put it in a very cognitive way people reason using deduction induction or abdu abduction so deduction reasoning is more like a top down reasoning it's a process of reasoning from fr from a premise to a conclusion like you follow some kind of rule boundaries or something another form of inference is inference with the best explanation wherein you are making use of some kind of clustering you are trying to see whether your observation is more you know closer to other observations and making use of clustering or bayesian approach to explain that but how do people actually reason what what causes the error so usually people end up doing a very fast intuitive or a low effort approach wherein we might employ heuristics to make decisions so for example i'm given a task to quickly recognize an item we might apply uh, some kind of representative heuristics to detect uh, say the reasoning to compare it with other elements I have have i seen that element before have i seen something similar before so i'm trying to determine the similarity of that test case to a previously observed item so an experienced person who has seen many examples of this and learned from generalizing it can make the decision pretty quickly however this can lead to something called cognitive bias for inexperienced people that is termed as representative bias now as i said i'll pick one example and i'll walk through how each of these can help you mitigate that so now we have we are moving on to how you know how xai generates explanations so if for, for X, xai as such explainability as a concept it's used to provide support and transparency where users can see some aspect of the inner state or the functioning of an ai system now say example if you are using ai for a detection aid a user might want to see um, explanations to improve the decision making say a system behave unexpectedly or giving some errors you might you might want to understand explanations for scrutiny or debugging to be able to identify the offending fault or take control to make corrections so that's how usually xai takes uh, xai generates prediction and it can use many algorithms you can use clustering based approach you can use algorithms which are lo local or global depending on the use case that you're working with now with that being said how can you target how can you make use of xai to support the reasoning and mitigate those bias so as i said let's pick up the case of representative bias now representative bias as we saw before it mainly happens when a decision maker perceives a current situation similar to say a wrong case of a wrong classification this might be due to lack of experience of seeing those examples before and even lack of focus and this can happen also with a machine learning model where the model actually picks up the wrong salient features right so to mitigate this kind of case we can use something called pro prototype instincts what it does is it represents different outcomes by rank ordering you can create a rank ordering by the similarity of that test case by explicitly showing some kind of a dissimilarity metric so to allow those comparison between case by case by inspecting features the difference between value you can see contrast as to difference between that particular test case to other cases and that might help you to mitigate bias in somewhere so amanda will now talk about where does bias exists in detail 
and how we would measure and mitigate bias. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, so now that Sharon has given us a great overview of bias and why we should be concerned about bias, I'd like to dive into talking about where bias exists. And then in the following slides, also how to measure that bias and how to mitigate bias as well. So the place bias primarily exists would be in the data. So there's three places that bias can exist. And the first place that we, we're going to look at is the data. Um, an example of this relates back to uh, the documentary that Sharon had talked about on the first slide called Coded Bias. And in this documentary, an algorithm bias researcher discovers that when she tried out a smart mirror that used com computer vision software as a black woman, her face was not detected. However, when she held up a white mask, the mirror finally detected her. And the most likely culprit for this error was that the data that was used to train the mirror um, didn't have a diverse set of images. So NIST actually has a great report that discusses that facial recognition algorithms can be biased towards the reg regions they are trained in. This is because most algorithms are trained on pictures that represent the, the people in that region. And it is highly likely the mirror was trained on pictures only from a small set of races and did not contain enough pictures of African-American people. This shows that the data used to train the model was potentially not diverse enough. The second place that we can have bias exist is in people. So people are the ones who train models and curate the data used to train models. As people, we all bring our own biases to model building. An example of this is an algorithm that the University of Texas at Austin used to grade applicants to the computer science PhD program. So in 2013, UT started using a machine learning system called GRADE, and GRADE stands for Graduate Admissions Evaluator. And it was created by a UT faculty member and graduate student in computer science, and it was originally created to help the graduate admissions committee in the department save time. So GRADE predicts how likely the admissions committee is to approve an applicant and it expresses that prediction as a numerical score out of five. The system also explains what factors most impacted its decision. GRADE's creators have said that the system is only programmed to replicate what the admissions committee was doing prior to 2013, not to make better decisions than humans could. And the system isn't programmed to use race or gender to make its predictions. And in fact, they said when it's given those features as options, it actually weights them as zero. Grades creators have said that this is evidence that the committee's decisions are gender and race neutral. However, something that should be considered is it's possible that the admissions committees prior to 2013 that the data is sourced from brought their own biases to the selection process. And those biases were then coded into the model by using that past data. This could harm minority classes if biases prior to 2013 existed in the admissions committee. And finally, the last place that to look for bias is in the model itself. And so a great example of this is actually the Twitter bot Tay created by Microsoft. So prior to releasing Tay, uh, Microsoft made sure that Tay was trained on a diverse set of data. And initially when she started interacting with users on Twitter, her tweets were mostly harmless. However, after some users shared racist language with Tay, she ended up picking up that information and started tweeting racist content herself. She also had a feature where you could essentially tell her to repeat the exact tweet that you tweeted at her and she would repeat anything you said. And some users, of course, manipulated this to have her tweet racist stuff. So these are some examples of where bias exists. Now let's talk about how we can measure bias. So there are numerous statistics and metrics that can be used to measure bias. However, I have highlighted a few from an open source tool called AI360 Fairness Tool. And while the tool has the ability to automatically calculate these metrics for you, you can also hand calculate all of these metrics. At their core, the metrics are based on the confusion matrix output and knowing which class is the favorable and unfavorable class. For example, if we were measuring bias in an algorithm that determined college admittance, and factored in race, our favorable class might be white and our unfavorable class might be African-Americans since in the past, African-Americans may have received unfavorable admissions decisions. In security, we have to be a little bit more creative with this and think of our favorable class as something that maybe we typically have more data or more experience with like PE files. And our unfavorable class might be something that we have less data for or that our model has performed worse on the in the past, such as .NET files. All of these metrics have a range in which if the output falls, the model is determined to be fair. 
For example, we'll take the first metric, statistical parity difference. It has a fair range of negative 0.1 and 0.1, where anything in that range is considered fair. So if we get a statistical parity difference of 0.2, then we can conclude that bias exists in our model because it resides outside of the fair range. Each of these metrics has an ideal use case where they would perform best. There are two opposing world views um, that we can use to kind of group the applications of these metrics. The first one is we're all equal. And the second one is what you see is what you get. The we're all equal worldview holds that all groups have similar abilities with respect to the task, even if we cannot observe this property. And the what you see is what you get worldview holds that the oper observations reflect ability with respect to the task. For example, if the application follows the we are all equal worldview, then the demographic parity metric should be used like disparate impact and statistical parity difference. If the application follows the what you see is what you get worldview, then the equality of odds metric should be used as average, such as average odds difference. Other group fairness metrics lie between the two worldviews. In addition, there is also the concept of group fairness versus individual fairness. Group fairness in its broadest sense partitions the population into groups defined by protected attributes and seeks for some statistical measure to be equal across all of the groups. Individual fairness, on the other hand, in its broadest sense, seeks for similar individuals to be treated similarity. similarly. If the application is concerned with both individual and group fairness, then something like the Thiel index should be used. So now that we know how to measure our bias, what do we do once we know that bias exists within our data, our model, our predictions? There's actually a few techniques that we can use to mitigate bias. And I have some listed on the slide, but it's not an exhaustive list of all of the techniques that can be used to mitigate bias. But these are some of the important ones that I wanted to highlight. The most important thing to remember is that mitigating bias starts with your data. This is always the first place you should look for bias and it's ground zero for trying to mitigate bias. There are two techniques that can be used to mitigate bias in your data. And these are re-weighting re and optimized pre-processing. Re-weighting generates weights for the training examples in each group uh, and dif differently to ensure fairness before classification. Optimized pre-processing learns a probabilistic transformation that edits the features and labels in the data with group fairness, individual distortion, and data fidelity constraints and objectives. In addition, you can look at some more simplistic techniques to mitigate bias in your data, such as undersampling and oversampling, and also sourcing more data. And all of these can help you to ensure that you have a more balanced data set for particular features that you are concerned about being biased. The next place that you should look to mitigate bias if the data approaches do not work or can't be implemented is in your classifier. One such example is adversarial debiasing. And adversarial debiasing learns a classifier to maximize prediction accuracy and simultaneously reduce an adversary's ability to determine the protected attribute from the predictions. This approach leads to a fair classifier as the predictions cannot carry any group discrimination information that the adversary can exploit in the future. Finally, the last place you can look to mitigate bias is in the predictions themselves. An example of this is reject option-based classification and reject option-based classification gives favorable outcomes to unprivileged groups and unfavorable outcomes to privileged groups and a confidence band around the decision boundaries with the highest uncertainty. So again, these are just a few techniques that you can use to mitigate bias. It's not an exhaustive list and there are many more out there as well. So now that we know how to measure and mitigate bias, let's apply this to a real world example uh, to kind of see how you would use them in action. So this example that I'm going to be discussing is actually from a paper that we've authored here at McAfee and is currently under review. And the paper details uh, algorithms that we created to detect deep fake images and videos. And it also introduces a new deep fake data set with high quality images. And we wanted to make sure to do an analysis on this new data set to determine how diverse our images were to make sure that our model wasn't biased towards certain ages, races, or genders. So what we did was we took images created by StyleGAN, which were deep fake images because they are not images of real people. And then we took images of real people that we scraped from the internet and we had our data set. So we had the deep fake images and the real images. We then took those images and passed them to an open source tool that you can find on GitHub called DeepFace. 
And DeepFace is a lightweight facial recognition and facial attribute analysis framework for Python. And it can detect things like age, gender, emotion, and race. And it uses state-of-the-art models such as VGG face in order to detect the faces. And the library is mainly based off Keras and TensorFlow. And so what we did was when we passed the images to this open source tool, it gave us a uh, output of what it determined to be the race, age, and gender of the person in the photo. And this was easier than manually going and labeling all of our data, all of our pictures, because we had so many pictures. So this tool kind of automated the process and made it easier for us to get a feel of the diversity of our image sets. You can see an example of the results that we had for race. So as you can see on the slide, a lot of our images from the subsample of images in our data set lean towards Caucasian. And we didn't have as many images for African-Americans or Indians. And so we really focused on how can we mitigate race in our algorithm and what can we do to kind of mitigate this bias? So you can see on this slide, the two tables detailing the results of the statistical measures of bias that we calculated that I discussed on the previous slide. As you can see for age and gender, all of these fall within the fair range for each of these different metrics. It, and the only one that's of real concern is race. So we have two instances where race um, does not fall within that fair range and instead falls in, uh, outside into bias. And that would be in the statistical parity difference and the disparate impact. And so we really wanted to focus on how could we mitigate these. And so what we chose to use was a technique called adversarial debiasing. And the technique of adversarial debiasing is currently one of the most popular techniques used to combat bias. It relies on adversarial training to remove bias from the latent representations learned by the model. So let Z in this diagram you see on the screen be some sensitive attribute that we want to prevent our algorithm from discriminating on. Uh, for example, age or race, in our case, it's, it's race. And it's typically insufficient to simply remove Z from our training data because it's often highly correlated with other features. In our case, it's difficult to remove Z because we're dealing with images and uh, we can't simply source more images because getting deep fake images is hard uh, to do as well as scraping real images from the, the internet. Um, and so it wasn't simply easy to either balance the races or anything like that. And so what we really want to do is to prevent our model from learning a representation of the input that relies on Z in any substantial way. And to this end, we trained our model to simultaneously predict the label Y and prevent a jointly trained adversary from predicting Z. So this technique allowed us to mitigate bias at the classifier level since we didn't have the option to balance out the images since sourcing more images was difficult for us. So you may be wondering, uh, I work in security and as Sharon mentioned, bias is also important to security. But you might be wondering, how can I use this in malware detection since I'm not dealing with images of humans or data related to humans? So I'm gonna walk through the process of how you would go about applying this in uh, the, the example of malware detection. So first, let's consider which features you might have that exhibit bias in your model or data set. So some examples of this might include file types. So if we, as we've mentioned previously, um, a lot of our data sets consist of PE files and not so much .NET files. So maybe we have a bias towards PE files because we have more data for them. Or malicious versus benign. Sometimes it can be easier to um, get benign samples than malicious samples. So maybe we have a lot more benign samples than malicious samples and we can be uh, biased towards benign samples. And then there's also malware families. So we try to have a diverse set of malware families in the data sets that we look at, but sometimes maybe we'll have a lot more examples of ransomware than we do of a motet, which means we might miss motet samples. So these are just some instances of where bias may exist in your data, and it's not an exclusive list, but it's some things to think about. So now that you've identified the features that might exhibit bias, you need to measure the bias in those features using the bias metrics that I discussed, such as statistical parity difference. So you wanna go through and actually measure all of these features you've uh, identified using the output from your model and the confusion matrix to determine if any of those metrics lie outside of the fair range and you do have bias in one of those feature categories. Then once you identify that bias, you can go ahead with mitigating that bias. And remember the first place to mitigate bias and the most important place to look is always in your data set. 
And again, you can do this simply by adding more. So say you have more ransomware samples than you do in MOTET samples. You can try sourcing more MOTET samples and adding them. If it's hard to source more MOTET samples, maybe you can balance out the family so that you downsample ransomware to be closer to a MOTET. So maybe the model is not as biased as um, uh, to ransomware. And then of course you can use the other techniques that I discussed on the previous slide, such as reweighting and pre-optimized pre uh, optimized pre-processing. And finally, once you've mitigated that bias, you want to re-measure the bias and the features using those bias metrics again to ensure that your mitigation step was successful. So this is using uh, the, the statistical parity metrics, the disparate impact, again, remeasuring those same metrics on the new model and the output of the confusion matrix from that model to determine if those bias metrics now lie within the fair range. And you want to remember to look at your false positive rate and your true positive weight, true, true positive rate to ensure that they are still in an acceptable range because there can be a, a trade-off between bias, uh, mitigating bias and false positive rate and true positive rate. So some key takeaways from all of the stuff that we've discussed in this uh, presentation are one, understand the biases that you bring to model building and the biases that exist in your data. Uh, second, you can use an open source tool such as the AI 360 fairness tool to measure attributes your model exhibits bias towards. And again, you can also hand calculate all the metrics that we mentioned. And then finally, you should go and reevaluate all the AI models within your organization and mitigate bias in any data or models that you might find. And with that, we'd like to thank you for listening to our presentation and Sharon and I can take any questions you have.